Good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to, is that even the second stage of this amazing app modernization day? Uh, modern app development, actually. So, yeah, I um, would suggest it's like 3.30ish p.m. in Germany right now, but it's definitely earlier in other places in the world. My name is Markus, and uh, I'll be Burr Sata's host today. So getting you all ready for an amazing keynote by a lifelong developer advocate. Um, Mr. Bursata himself is uh, going to present everything you probably always wanted to know about becoming the developer's developer. I'm already pretty excited, so I'll be hanging out in the background watching the chat. Um, there's not a lot of housekeeping that we need to do. I just encourage you to use the chat feature. If you have any questions, reach out. Burr also shared a couple of links already. Make sure to join the Definition Slack if you have any questions. He also shared his slides. So if you want to follow along live, um, please feel free to do so. And uh, here he comes, Mr. Burr Sutter. Well, hello, hello, hello. All right. Good morning. Fantastic. I hope everyone's excited because we got a lot of fun things to talk about today. And we're going to basically hit you with a lot of funny images, a lot of fun slides, maybe a few demos, but talk to you about all things. Uh, let's call it platform engineering, platformers product, being the developer's developer. That's part of it. So I'm going to be watching the chat. Feel free to throw comments there. I'll try to hit them as I can. And we're going to move really fast. As I said, I'll probably drop some URLs into the chat and let's go ahead and screen share though. So actually, I'll give you a survey in a moment. So look for that survey. Share screen here. Let's get this one. Okay, okay, okay. So you, now you should see my nice big unicorn there. So we're going to talk about becoming the developer's developer. The idea being that there are developers who develop for developers. Hopefully that makes some sense, right? Developers who develop for developers. I know that sounds kind of funny, but you'll make sense as we get through the presentation. So let's dive right on in here. Bum, 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 bum. We get the mouse in the right spot. Okay. One thing I'd like to mention, though, is when it comes to DevOps or specifically DevNation and the icon that we use there, we, gave, we came up with that icon for a reason. So I like thinking in terms of DevOps, right? You've heard that from me before. And some people might think of that as Dev greater than Ops. Some people might think of that as Ops less than Dev. Hopefully they don't think that way, but I've heard things of that nature. But what about Dev raised to the power of Ops? Right. That's what I like to think about there. So that's why I have that little carrot there. And that is what became part of our Dev Nation icon. Right. So that just keep that in mind for people here for Dev Nation today. That was why that was there. That's a little bit of the history. And I think we're going to talk about Dev, Sec and Ops today. All right. So let's talk about your journey to awesomeness. You've seen this kind of slide from me before, but we're going to focus a little bit more today on what it means to be a platform engineer, offer platform as product and think about what it means to offer an IDP and all the elements that might go into that. We're going to talk about a lot of things in a fairly short period of time. And this is not meant to be a deep dive into any one of these areas. It's more a high level set of ideas that hopefully will inspire you to go do more things. Now, we're going to have a little survey here. Let me copy and paste the survey URL into the chat. So you can either grab that QR code off my screen. I'm also going to put it here in the chat. There we go. You should see it there. I don't see anyone on our public Slack, but, you know, for anyone on our public Slack, let's add it there also. And so if you're on the Dev Nation Slack, you now have that link. If you're in this session, you have the link also. Jump on that item right there. And then you're going to be answering a couple of simple questions for me. Okay, so let me get out of here and show you what this thing looks like as you respond. There we go. So let's go here. So we just need a few people to answer the questions. Our goal is to better understand who our audience is. And for those people who are, in fact, managers, claim it. Own it. Be proud of it, right? I'm in management these days myself, not necessarily a day-to-day -day program any longer. Uh, and that could probably be a good thing. Looks like we have a lot of architects here. I love that word architect because it can cover so many different roles within an IT organization. Nobody claiming the business analyst role. And surely there's got to be an other somewhere in here, meaning, you know, I don't like any of these roles. I, I think they don't really fit me very well. But please put that into the session. Uh, it'll, have, it'll give me a better feel for who we have with us today. And also, I think for our developers or ops or architects, you're going to see some things you like in today's session. Our lone security person here, do not feel 
that you're all alone, right? We're going to talk about some security things and hopefully, hopefully you'll find that I, I, I got it right for the security person. You can tell me if I got it wrong and you can do that via the chat. Feel free to yell at me and chat as we go throughout the session. Okay. You can see we have a pretty good crowd here. Now, let me ask you one more question. There's another question on a little survey. And I want you to think about this for a moment because I find this to be a massive challenge within an IT organization. So when I go out and speak to large customer organizations, when I go out and speak to large entities, I'm talking the big branded guys, right? You know, the Fortune 500, the S&P 500, the Global 2000. They will tell me that once they, once they discover uh, what, what it means to make a developer wait, right? Where they have developer wait time. Uh, well, here's the scenario. A new developer was just hired. They got their laptop. They got their VPN. They got their access to the system. How long or how many weeks does it take for them to become productive? Or let's say you're a developer already working at the company, right? How long does it take for you to get access to a computer, access to a virtual machine? You file a ticket and you wait, All right? So think about that for me. And let's go to this next slide here. If it will go, there we go. So I'm just kind of curious to know, for anybody who has to request from central IT, how long does it take to get access to a virtual machine, access to a computer, basically? Because if I have a great idea and I want to build my next generation cool thing and I might need a virtual machine with a Kafka running on it, or maybe I need access to a Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster, or maybe I need access to whatever resource, I file a ticket and I wait and I wait and I wait. How long does it take you to wait? And I'm just kind of curious to know what that is for the audience here. And uh, you can see we have some people saying less than a day. I'm wondering if those are our people who actually are the VMware administrators and the big organizations, you know, who have access to those virtual machines as the, as the admins, the cluster admins, as an example. Uh, and it's funny, too. We see some people here at 10 plus days. I've actually found that many corporations are in that three week plus world. Right. One actually told me six weeks. So I make this point because. This wait time that we're talking about here, any wait time at all, if it's longer than, let's say, 50 seconds or longer than, let's say, an hour or two, the problem is you have people who need access to resources sitting on their hands and waiting. Would that be their getting started experience as a new hire? Or I have a new idea where the business has come to me with this amazing idea and I want to start on it right now. So wait time is part of our traditional IT world, and I think that's highly problematic. OK, so KVM there, Christian. Fantastic. So if you got access to KVM, you can launch your own virtual machines rather rapidly. But I do wonder, Christian, if if you work for a big old corporation, you know, how many v uh, VMs can you launch without them noticing <laughs> and or asking you to wait for them? OK, so thank you for that information. Uh, that just kind of gives me a little feel for what we're doing in our world. Let's get back into our little presentation and get rocking here. OK, so. Let's talk about the world of dev versus ops. You notice my little programmer here on the on the left hand side. My programmers rocking the headphones, and at 4:45 on Friday, they think they can just check their code into their Git repo, Git commit, Git push, and they're high fiving each other. They're out the door. They're heading for the pub uh, at 4:45 on Friday. Well, the ops person, often Friday night, if you work in a big bank or maybe out throughout the weekend, has to figure out how to make that thing run. And I have had this personal experience working with a production team, both the development side and the operation side. I was the owner. Of, I owned both sides of that equation. And I had to get the system up and running, the new changes in production by Monday, because that's when the business started back at their jobs. Now, this is eons ago before we started 24 by 7 businesses. But that concept bothered me greatly. The idea that the development team just thought they could hand off whatever garbage to the ops people and the ops people have to suffer accordingly. And that had to change. And in this specific case, I actually brought all the developers in on Saturday. And this only had to happen a couple of times, by the way. So in order to help the developers understand empathy, we brought them in on Saturday where they just simply watched the operations team struggle with the deployment of their code base into production. You do that two Saturdays in a row, the developers write vastly better code. And this taught me a valuable lesson. This is actually 20 plus years ago, right? They taught me a valuable lesson. When dev understands some accountability and has some empathy for their code running in production where it sees real business value, they fundamentally change their ways and they write better code. So I'm us thinking about that basic concept. Can developers write better code once they understand having some accountability, some responsibility, and seeing what it looks like uh, in a production environment? Because in many organizations, it might look like this. 
right? The ability to push code to production might be this amorphous blob, much like you've heard the story right before. I think it's the Greek story where uh, I forget what the fellow's name, but basically he kept pushing the stone, the boulder uphill, and he kept rolling back down on him and crushing him. So push the boulder uphill, roll back down and crush him. That idea here was uh, what, I, what inspired this image. And I like to think of software development not as a nice boulder, right? A boulder would be awesome. That has structural integrity. Software is like this amorphous blob of stuff with a gang of people trying to get it over the finish line, push it uphill. And you can see right here, we have this person standing in this direction. And you might be thinking, well, who is that? Well, I know what some of you are saying right now. You're screaming at your laptop. You're yelling at your microphone. That's the security team, or that's the operations team, the compliance team, right? Sisyphus. There you go. Thank you, Joseph. Right. So you, you have the idea as to who's pushing back, who is basically saying this cannot go. This shall not pass. It's not Gandalf, by the way. All right. How about this person up top here? You might be looking at this person going, wow. OK, they're on top of the thing. They're on top of the game here, but they're facing the wrong direction. Ah, that's our architect. We had so many architects earlier. Right. So we know our architects, they're on top of their game. Hopefully they're facing the right direction most often than not, but they're trying to surf the blob. They're trying to ride the wave, hoping to get over the finish line and make this magic happen. And how about this person down here at the bottom? Well, this, in fact, if you actually are from my world of DevSecOps, DevOps, that is my operations person. So I'd like all the developers here to think about who is being crushed under the enormous weight of this blob that we've created. All right. So, yep. So you can see right there where someone's in that situation. You basically are feeling that pain. Now, here's the part that's really funny about this to me. If we are successful at pushing that blob up the hill and into production once, we have to do it again in three more months, in three more months, again and again and again. And those three-month deployment intervals, why they seem long at this point in time, they're actually fast by Java E standards. We used to be six-month, 12-month deployment intervals. But still, it doesn't matter what the deployment interval is. The problem is it's inhumane. We have to do this again and again and again. So think about that. It's not fun. Because what we don't want anymore is the concept that the developer can throw their stuff over the wall and hit the other person in the head. This is no longer the fun way to do things. The developer and the operations team have shared responsibility from this point forward. They have to go hand in hand to deliver the software to production together. Now, I want you thinking about security now, right? We're going to talk about DevSecOps more today. And guess what? There's a third party in our love triangle. So think about that for a second. There's not just these different development teams that run and are out there associated with different lines of business. And there's not this central IT ops team or platform team responsible for the infrastructure. There's also the security uh, and compliance team. The people that are basically producing all these controls, they use the term controls. They use the terms evidence. They have people taking photos with their smartphone of people's laptops to show that people did a certain task. We're, we're, no, they're kind of live in this weird world. They have their own weird language, but they are part of the equation. We have to embrace them. We have to include them and also teach them English because I have noticed whenever you speak to them, they speak almost like they have their own jargon and it's still related to the software that we build and architect, which I think is very interesting. So let's talk about dev second ops for a moment. And this is actually important and a subtle message that I want you guys to pick up on here. Okay. So if you think about developer, right? The developer, the security officer, the security compliance engineer, right? The ops engineer, the DevOps engineer, whomever you, however you title those folks. And there are definitely more than three people in the equation, but let's choose these three. Whenever the three of them have to articulate and think about a problem, they probably all have their own unique, right? Their own unique way of thinking about that problem. In other words, we might all be looking at the same thing. And if you've seen some of my other presentations, I love talking about the five blind men and the elephant, right? If you've ever heard that metaphor or seen that parable, this is the same problem. It's all about communications. And the idea here is that we form different images in our head based on hearing the exact same words. We can all interview the same user and come up with a completely different conclusion. We can all read the same document and come up with a completely different uh, uh, idea, an image in our head. So that's a very important point. And I want us thinking about that because these folks have different motivations. They have different incentives. Developers want to rock out their innovation, knock out new capability. Here's new feature, new feature, new feature. 
operations, of course, value, stability, resiliency, reliability. They want to make sure this thing doesn't just get ripped down uh, by, you know, just simple load of all the people coming in and hitting the system. And then the security team wants to make sure hackers don't camp out in your code base and run their crypto miners on your infrastructure or steal all your data. Right. That's an important aspect of this also. So how do we actually get more collaboration out of these folks? How do we actually get it so that they have the same image in their head with greater collaboration, a shared understanding, and shared responsibility? This is tricky. And the ultimate goal is to make it so they all love each other. Now, you might be thinking this is a very funny image. How in the world can we love these people? They're not like people. Well, I've had this discussion with developers and architects before. I actually had someone challenge me years ago. Burr, you don't understand. I can't deal with that person over there. They always tell me no. They never will let us do anything innovative and interesting and introduce a new software, a new open source capability, whatever it might be. And, and I'll say, wait, what, when was the last time you took that person to lunch? And you can tell I had blown their mind. Their, uh, their face was like shocked. Like, what do you mean take the person to lunch? And I said, they are human too. And I bet they eat lunch, or at least they eat food. So maybe you can have food with the person and act like they're a human. And that was a game changer. I could tell at that moment they were like, oh, they are human. Yes, these, these, these folks are humans, and they behave like humans. They just use different jargon, all kinds of funny uh, nomenclature. They would talk about computers and talk about software, uh, which I always think is interesting because it's still software and computers. I don't know why we have to have funny jargon. But the point is, we actually all want the same things. It's so important. So important, okay? All right, let's keep going. The ultimate goal here is to have shared goals, shared responsibility, dev, sec, and ops all working together as a unified team to push that boulder up the hill. By the way, it doesn't mean here that dev is pushing the security team, which is pushing the ops team. That's not really what I was going for. The goal here was that they would all be working together. There's also that free ebook there that you want to get access to. And if you have access to the slide deck, you have access to all the links, by the way. I published the slide deck URL in the chat earlier but you wanna make sure that you can get access to everything. And we have been using our, 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 our research tools to basically discover more information about app security, developer agility, observability, consistent configs. So if you go get that free ebook, you'll see where our UX research team has specifically sat down with developers, interviewed them and platform engineers, by the way, to understand better what their shared responsibility model looks like, what their underserved needs are, and what that means to live in this new DevSecOps world. So there's uh, Savannah there, publish the deck one more time. Feel free to grab ac access to the deck and then go download that free ebook, okay? So here's the ebook cover. Make sure you go grab that. Uh, great, get a copy of that right there. You can see Colin, Dash, and Marcus all worked on that. Marcus, as you saw earlier in our introduction. Go grab that book. It'll give you some really nice information about how to secure the software supply chain or the needs therein when it comes to DevSecOps. A quick history lesson, and we'll keep moving pretty fast here because we don't need to spend time on the all the history. For some of us here, we've lived through this history. In my case, I lived through more than this history. But I think it's pretty interesting to understand that Java, in the case of for those Java folks out there, it was back in 1996. And HTTP 1.1 1 .1 was 1997. So think about that for a second. We've been building HTTP-based applications since, you know, actually before that, HTTP 1.0 back in 95. You know, we've been building web-based stuff for a while. Red Enterprise Linux well, over there in two, the year 2000. Okay, so so many things have happened. The Agile Manifesto in 2001. I actually found myself quoting the Agile Manifesto to someone just this year. So yes, it was a, a, a document published in 2001, but people still don't know what it means. And sometimes we have to talk about it with them. So look at all these amazing things that happened in our journey to becoming cloud natives. You can see where Spring Boot happened and Docker and microservices and Kubernetes. And all that came to a massive, big conclusion in 2015. At that moment is when Red Hat launched Red Hat OpenShift, specifically based on Kubernetes. And we uh, showed the world this thing called containers and pods. We launched a thousand containers, I launched a thousand pods live on stage. And that link right there will get you access to that demonstration. But that's from 2015. It's 2023, eight years later. What has happened in the last eight years? And I think it's important to think about. So over the last eight years, we introduced some new things like Helm and Spinnaker and Istio and GitOps was born. GitOps by WeWorks in 2017, Argo CD born in 2018, the Accelerate book where we learned all about the Dora metrics over in 2018. Those four key metrics, of course, by ThoughtWorks, they recommend the trial of them. But now we're talking about things like team topologies, the trialing of platform engineering, the adopting of platform engineering. So a lot has happened since that 2015 moment. 
Okay. And so we, I just want you thinking about that. And by the way, I mentioned Quarkus here. That was born in 2019. Some of you just saw some of that today for the first time. But this is an example of all the innovation that is occurring. And you should note that it's occurring ever faster than ever before. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what ThoughtWorks says about these things. They're talking about applying product management to internal platforms. They're talking about trialing platform engineering teams. So in other words, there's these new phrases that are showing up in our vernacular, right? This concept of platform engineering, this concept of product management around the platform, and this is super critical. And for many of our architects and developers, this is the space you might want to play in going forward, at least if you work for a large organization that serves a large number of developers. And I think it's important for us to be thinking about it and talking about these things. And some of you might know that I have spoken to many of you over the, over the last couple of months about these specific topics. I know Christian and I spent some time together. Wolfgang and I spent some time together. So perhaps some of you and I have already talked about say, these same things. Because what our goal is now is to practice platform as a product. So it's more than just platform engineering platform and what do we do to create the developer experience. It is about actually productizing it, thinking in terms of being a product manager and what it means to deliver that product to our user base. Okay, so what is a platform? All right, a digital platform is a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support, all arranged as a compelling internal product. We're gonna break this definition down and show you some very interesting things about it. Okay, so we're gonna get into this. So APIs, tools, services, and knowledge. This is so critical. Self-service, APIs, tools, services, and knowledge. So right here, I tried to identify maybe some of those APIs and tools that we're talking about here and services that we're talking about. Now, in your platform, you don't have to do all these things. You might have to do some of these things and you of course have to choose tools across the software development lifecycle that meets the needs of your organization. You can see right here, based on the stack, that some of these things are lower level, like we need to figure out what our compute network and storage look like, our infrastructure look, looks like. Are we using Kubernetes and namespaces as a service? Or does everybody get their own Kubernetes? Or does everyone get their own virtual machines? How do we deal with configuration management, et cetera? And then the very top of the stack is something like Backstage, the portal. All right, the portal being the user interface that people would engage this entire layered cake of opportunities here. But it should be noted that right away, this is not a trivial thing to go do. Organizations have been working on this for several years. I've, and then again, if you've uh, spoken with me over the last several months, I've spent time with some of the world's largest organizations talking about this stack and the way they've implemented parts of it within their organization. So much has happened within the space. Uh, and and this, uh, Burr still has hair. And yeah, that's true. I still have some hair left on my head. It's getting grayer by the day. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So let's get into this. I want to kind of do it from this perspective. All right. So let's think about the pipeline. Think about what it means for the decoder to write some code and get it all into production. Right. So we've been talking about that a lot today. And the reason I focus on this topic is because I'd like to tell all the programmers out there, the, the developers, those programmers I talked about, those developers. Right. If depending on how you think of it, the if you write a bunch of cool code, it doesn't matter how cool your curly braces are and how great your semicolons are and what your spaces versus tabs are and how elegant your algorithms are and the fact that you use Go, Rust, or C Sharp, or Java, or JavaScript. The issue is, until it runs in production, it adds no value. So it is valueless until it makes it to production and serves the need of the organization it was meant to serve, whatever that might be. So let's talk about that for a second and think about the pipeline. Okay, so the developer is going to be doing their edit, save, refresh. If you've seen a Quarkus presentation these days, you've seen edit, save, refresh. Write a little code, save it in the ID, control S, refresh that browser, boom, we see that Java code now running instantaneously. It's kind of like magical because we're not used to seeing that in the Java universe. Maybe if you're JavaScript or Python, you're a little more used to that sort of behavior. But the idea of edit, save, refresh, edit, save, refresh, refresh, using your favorite IDE, using your favorite tool like IntelliJ, or, or maybe you have another JetBrains IDE, or you have VI or Emacs, doesn't really matter. Notepad++ is still pretty popular, I think. Okay. All right. And so you're going to run the test. You're going to run your debugger. You're going to do a git commit and a git push, right? So think about that. Git commit, git push is like the magical moment because you think I'm ready. I'm ready for the world to see my creation. I built this amazing thing. Got my curly braces, semicolons all sorted out, and the world should see it. So at this point, the next phase kicks in. The pipeline kicks in. A webhook kicks in. Uh, maybe it's all based on your GitLab or your GitHub, but the webhook kicks in, kicks off the pipeline, and it runs your Jenkins, your Azure DevOps, your Tecton, right? Whatever it might be, your Red Hat Trusted Application Pipeline, and it's going to do a Git clone. 
it's going to do a Maven uh, clean compile test. It's going to run those same tests that you ran on your laptop in some cases. And it's going to do a compile and a package. It's going to create the fat jar if it's a Java application. And this is, of course, Maven. If you have an NPM uh, install, or you might have a pip install, things like that. And it might even run check style. It might even run Sonar Cube. So you're going to run a series of tools within the pipeline to do the basics of checking everything out, seeing that things are okay, as a, an example. And that's part of the, what people think of as the development stage. Then there might also be an integration phase or a performance testing phase, soak test, smoke test phase. But typically, we might use Selenium. We might scan things with Sneak. We might use Cucumber for additional you know, testing. We might push to a repository. Maybe that's our artifactory by JFrog, or maybe it's Quay. But we're going to basically do all these things within the context of the pipeline. And then, of course, when we're ready to roll it out and deploy it, we might update a GitOps repo. We, again, might have a webhook associated with that. We'll do a git clone, maybe. But Argo is going to basically do a diff and sync, and it's going to basically move those bits into that production environment by syncing what it sees in the Git repo into what is the live running system. So Argo is a key piece of that. And of course, we have our monitoring solutions like Prometheus, and Kibana, and PagerDuty, and Datadog. And we're going to basically just ensure that everything's all good, everything's all green. We're going to have our different analytic tools to identify that. OK? So it's important to understand who owns what. The app developer kind of owns these things like the edit, save, refresh, right? They have their laptop. They run their local test. They run their local debugger. They use Git uh, command line or Git GUI from their Visual Studio Code or IntelliJ. So they have a lot of control over those kinds of things, including what goes in the POM XML or the package JSON or the requirements.txt. And then this other group of things, right, is often negotiated or collaborated with, uh, with the platform team, the platform engineer, the architect, the security influenced aspects of this. The security team wants to say, hey, run the sneak scanner or run the, you know, uh, so uh, sonar type, you know, scanner, whatever the scanner it is that they've selected. So all these things happen within the context of the pipeline that glues all this together, but it's actually a collaboration of multiple parties working together. So when I was all thinking about that, because it's important to understand, it's not that the developer controls everything, and it's not that the operations, the platform team, you know, control everything, or the security team. It's a collaboration where we all work together. OK, also, let's not forget about our end users out there, those accountants and nurses and bank tellers, the people who use the stuff at the end of the day. I think we tend to forget that as an industry. And I know I often forget it as I'm out there talking with developers and operations folks and security people. It's like at the end of the day, what matters are are the end users who want the thing, right? Whatever the organization is, are they benefited and positively impacted by the change that you made? You fixed the bug, you closed the back door, of the security flaw, you added the new feature. Did they have a positive experience? We've got to forget, uh, remember that more often. Okay, so let's talk more about self-service and some support ideas, compelling internal product. There's some interesting ideas here. Now, in order to be compelling and self-service, we got to know for whom, who is our target. And I think this is so important because if we're platform people, who is our customer? So our customer, if we think about it, and we understand the book Team Topology is a great book, and I have a whole group of book recommendations at the end, we would basically say that the stream align team is the customer of the platform team. The stream align team is the team that's producing the value that lands on the end user mobile uh, smart applica uh, smartphone application, right? It's the, it's the mobile app that lands on the smartphone. It is the API that they consume in a B2B business to business sense. It is the web-based application that they refresh in their browser and see the change based on what was changed to them. So the value stream align team is a customer of that platform team. And so let's talk more about those platform people because let's understand who our customers are a little bit better. So if you look at the annual survey from 2021, the Kubernetes annual survey, you'll see that the Kubernetes ecosystem is claiming 5.6 million developers and 31% of all back-end developers. That kind of blew my mind when I saw that statistic. So they're estimating that they've already penetrated the market of 31% of all back-end developers. That's kind of amazing to me. And we'll see some other numbers in a second to show that that's actually a fairly deep penetration when it comes to the technology adoption life cycle. So developers feel like they're, they're learning that Kubernetes thing. They're knowing what a kube control apply dash F is. They know what YAML is. They know what deployment service and pod is. That's interesting to me. Because at the end of the day, what we really need to do for that value stream aligned team is reduce their cognitive load. So let's think about cognitive load for a second. Now, this is an important slide that we should talk about for a moment. 
For those folks who've been around the block a little while, and I'll tell you a little story, right? I actually started back in the days of WIFL. See that WFL there? Not the JCL. The JCL was for the cool kids. That's job control language. They had the expensive IBM mainframes. The company I worked for didn't have that kind of money. We had the inexpensive Unisys mainframe, and we had WIFL. WFL workflow language. But at the end of the day, it was all COBOL or some derivative of COBOL 4GL generation language. And there was a built-in IDE right inside your green screen terminal. And you had a terminal and you worked on that. And it was mostly batch-based applications. As a matter of fact, if you were a programmer back in this time frame, you might actually write some code and that would spin up a tape drive, write it to a tape drive. You would then carry the tape drive to a little set of cubby holes because the cubby holes were where you would input the tape drive, just lay it there with some instructions, maybe some written instructions for the operations team who wore white lab coats and sat in a really cold room that might actually gas them with argon in case there's a fire. And they work with these machines that were the size of, you know, washing machines and refrigerators, and they would load that tape and they would run your program. And this is all just to debug your code, by the way. And then they might give you a big green banded paper report out the other end and put it back in the cubby hole. And, uh, you know, the, the next day you come back, get your tape back, get your uh, green banded uh, paper back and know if your application worked or, uh, correctly or not. That was how you ran a test. Now, some of you are a little bit more older school than that. You're thinking, wait, I had I actually had punch cards. Well, I am a little bit. I'm talking post punch cards here. OK, so the idea is that things have changed dramatically for the developer. The days of actually building a tape and running and getting a paper report just to run a test and a debug, right, is changed dramatically. But it has changed in such a ways that is so complicated now. If you think of the person in the modern era has to know something about what serverless is, and of course they have the cloud, they got this Kubernetes thing, they got Node.js and Java. You might be learning Go and Rust and Python because you're doing a little data science, right? You got to figure out what to do with gRPC at this point and Vue React and you know Next.js and Angular. There, there's an amazing amount of things to be learning at this moment in time. And it is a bit overwhelming. I imagine that just looking at the slide right now has given some people a little anxiety as they think about being overwhelmed themselves. Okay. So Mark there has basically been part of the Wiffle language also. So there you go. So I actually had this question came uh, that came up in an email thread. And I know it's too small to read on the slide, but that's why you have access to the slide deck. And this was basically the summation of an email conversation that I had with a group of people within Red Hat. And some people were asking, why is it so damn complicated? Why is it so hard? And, and I, I had to think about it for a second, but this was my response. And I kind of put it right here on this slide because I think it's super important for us to understand. Why is it so complicated? Because 20, 30 years ago, when we built applications as software developers, those applications went to our brother and sister employees, right? In other words, we built apps for employees of about one to five users. At a time, about 20 years ago, the average user count per application was a little bit more than one user, okay? So that the world was one user per, per application instance back in the day, primarily because we ran everything on desktops. We did this thing called client server, right? We basically had Microsoft Office and Access and Fire, uh, Fo uh, Fox Pro. We basically used things, one user application, right? One user. And maybe we had five users if we had a multi-user system. In the new world we're living in, right, we have a, an application that basically is using AI and real-time video streaming to do a TikTok dance move, analyze it in real time for a million users or consumers with their smartphone. So the world has changed dramatically. And because of that dramatic change of user count, user volume, and also attack service and security concerns, because guess what? If you're making an application available to the world at large via TikTok and an API, well, that's got a different security profile than if you were just giving it to a single employee within your business, within your organization, and on your VPN. So we have to constantly figure out how to relieve that cognitive load, relieve that pressure, because we're always improving, we're scaling, we're more, better securing, making things more reliable and reusable. Okay. Now, look at this for a moment. This is the Kubernetes ecosystem. Again, why is it so complicated? Why are there so many things I might have to learn? And I know there's just far too many. I can't learn them all. I don't have time to learn all these things either. So we at Red Hat try our best to basically educate you on the ones we think are important and are interesting to us. So we do that sort of thing, hopefully, and curate this for the rest of you. Okay. Now, cognitive load can be overwhelming. I like this particular set of animated GIFs. It's like, uh, there's just too many things happening at the same time. So now, 
we got to reduce cognitive load, but let's talk about compelling. And this is actually the most important part. Part, The platform you create for all the other development teams to be that developer's developer, to be the architect, is to make it compelling. And I think this is super critical. And this is the part I want to focus on for the remaining part of our session. This is the part that super excites me if this is not obvious. So a digital platform with all the self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support ranged as a compelling internal product. Internal product. And it's got to be compelling because it's not mandatory. No longer are you going to be the draconian uh, boss who says you must use this tool because we say so. You must use this capability, this portal, this uh, this CI solution, this task, this uh, security scanner because we say so. Because it needs to be compelling because what you want is a greater solution that makes the developers ever happier and ever more productive and we as a whole work well together. So I want to talk about this thing called the uh, Technology Adoption Lifecycle, the TLAC, the, t the TALC, I call it, Technology Adoption Lifecycle. A lot of people may not have heard of this, but it's, in, and it's an important element that was invented, I think, back in the 60s at this point. I came to learn about it back in the early 90s based on the book called Crossing the Chasm. If you've never read this book, I highly recommend it. There's a bunch of other book recommendations later in the slide deck. But this was one of those moments uh, where I read this in early part of my career. I also took a bunch of classes around TQM and learning the Deming model for manufacturing back in the early 90s. And between this book and learning about Deming and total quality management and how the Toyota uh, process worked, it taught me a lot about how I think about software. Fundamental game changers for how my brain worked at the time. So I like thinking about this technology adoption lifecycle a lot. And it breaks down into these major categories, from innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. Now, I'll tell you right now, you as a large audience here on the public internet have not, uh, I've not really given this presentation outside of Red Hat before. So there's going to be some things in here that might be controversial. And I want you guys to yell at me in chat if you feel I've offended a group or, no, or someone like that. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how people react to what they're about to see. So if you believe that the technology adoption lifestyle does have this five buckets, if you will, and there is this bell curve of where the majority sit versus the people at the, uh, the various ends, it's important to think about what psychographics motivate these people. What might they do? How might they behave? And who in my organization that I'm seeking to serve might fit these things, the, fit these uh, psychographics, fit these characteristics. So like the Uber geeks, the hardcore innovators, the, some of the folks right in this chat right now, you might go out to GitHub, find a source code, and you're happy to get clone and build from source to use that new component, that new library, that new capability, and check it out. You might even fork that project on GitHub. You might even start your own project on GitHub, but you know how to go direct to GitHub and grow and direct to source to understand better what that capability might use. You would actually read the sources to learn the API. You might look at the readme file, the markdown file, but by default, you can also dig into that Go code, and I've had to do that myself, or dig into that Java code or that JavaScript code to understand it. And you might also be a little bit of a disruptor. You might be a change agent. You might be a catalyst. And you tend to work at dot coms or startups, or maybe you're an innovator within you know, the big bank or the big insurance company, but you're an innovator. You're a super uber geek, okay? Now, what about the early adopters? Now, the early adopters are still going to be looking at some of those same things, but they would prefer to download a zip file or NPM install or basically you know, use a Go module. While they can certainly go to source, they you know, would just rather consume the thing that's already ready for them to consume. Maybe they brew install it on their Mac, or they basically just chocolately install it on their Windows machine. Or they might use a SaaS-based API. And they'd like to have documentation. They'd rather not have to go to the source code and figure it all out. They'd rather read their markdown file that nicely lays out exactly how they should get started and what they should do and what this capability uh, involves. That's a key element of it. They will participate in forums. They will also contribute and write and speak at different conferences like at this one today right now. They work as consultants or maybe they work in vendors. Maybe they work for Red Hat as an example. And I like this one. I put this one on here. They own their own laptop. This is a lesson I learned many years ago. If you're a professional software developer, operations person, architect, et cetera, et cetera, you should never be beholden to your employer for computing hardware. Let, take that crap and toss it off your desk because we all know that the, the, uh, the stuff that they give you at your corporation is normally junk and five years old or three years old. That's true of Red Hat, by the way, too. We give a lot of crap to our people. Go buy your own real good hardware and keep it, whether that be desktop, building your own little lab, building your own data center, buying your own MacBook if that's what it was required because they won't give you one. 
by your own hardware, if you fall in this category of early adopter. Then there's the early majority. Now, the majority is where we get to the meat and potatoes of the people, right? This is 34%. As you read the crossing the chasm, we are now crossing the chasm, right, and getting to that majority. And these folks want tools. They want wizards. They want examples and tutorials. They want patterns and practices. They want obvious productivity gains. And they might go to the conference given by the, the talk given by the early adopter. They might actually read the books and blogs written by that early adopter. And they might even go to a user group. And they might even deliver a brown bag lunch within their organization. Okay, could be could be a thing that they do. Now let's look at the late majority. So the late majority tends to move when the boss is sold. The late majority will always use Google and go Stack Overflow to copy and paste. They would prefer a formal training class. Okay, they might want a mentor. Who can they find to be a mentor for them? And they tend to adopt a technology when it starts to impact their career. In other words, they're not going to be super proactive. They're going to learn that thing called Java now because, you know what, their Pascal skills are running out of gas. And they'd like to keep working for a little bit longer. So, so even though they made a good living for the last 20 years on Pascal, now they're learning Java for the first time because they'd like to keep working for a little bit longer before they retire. So if you're a Java person, you might be thinking, now i got to learn a little Go or a little Rust or a little Python or something else or a little JavaScript. So it, the point is that they tend to be motivated when they're forced to be motivated. This person, by the way, is the same person that the boss, okay? Think about this in your old office before the pandemic. We had all our cubicles, we had our chairs. The boss might actually print out a blog or print out an article and leave it on our chair. So when we came in the next morning, we might find that article and go, ooh, the boss wants us to look, about, look at this new technology or new technique or new idea, like continuous integration for the first time. Now the laggards, of course, they demand training. So the late majority, they'd like some training, formal training. Laggards say, I need training. If you don't train me, I won't move. As a matter of fact, I love the training because it gives me a week off from work. Okay. I love the brown bag lunches because I get free lunch. Give me that free pizza. That's an awesome thing. So <laughs> I make I make these points because guess what? I have no problem talking to you guys here in this conversation about these things because you are not laggards if you are here. You're probably not late majority if you are here because you would not be here if you had the attributes of a laggard, even late majority. You are here and therefore you're probably early adopter, early majority. Okay. But this is important because if we build platforms, we build tools, we build capabilities. This is true of Red Hat or true of anybody out there in the platform engineering game. You have to understand the audience you have to sell to. Okay. I like to refer to this concept of uh, pathfinders and builders. I put them in two big groups to make this a little bit easier. The pathfinder is the pre are the influencers you must motivate that you must capture if you can. And you, if you have them in your organization, if not, you got to be the pathfinder for your organization. And then the builder are the people, the worker bees, the people who have to bang out that code, uh, you know, kind of that nine to five experience, if you will, doing the work they're given. Here's another way to think of this. If you worked in a manufacturing organization, there are the engineers who design the productization pipeline, meaning the people who design the assembly line, make sure all the tools are in the right location, make sure all the blueprints make sense. That's the engineer. And then there are the assembly line workers, the people who come in every day and punch out the square peg into the square hole. You've got to have both types of people to be productive and successful in today's world. Okay. So the pathfinder, you got to think of them as your marketing target. The builder is your production target, your product target. You have to build tools and capabilities for the average builder while at the same time making sure the pathfinder can be successful. All right. So think about it like this though. We're not talking about unicorns here. We're talking about horses. All right. I like this little book and I thought the image was great. Go get a, go that link there and get you a copy of the book to read it to your child. Now, this, this developer game is important to understand because there's 31 million developers, according to IDC, as of 2022. Now, this number used to be 20 million. I've been saying 2020, 20, IDC upped the number on me. I wasn't paying attention. So it's 31 million. That's a lot. Okay. And it's grown from 20 to 30 just in the last few years. And it's expected in the next few years to grow to 48. Oh my, oh wow. So where are all these people coming from? It's like they're coming out of the woods here. And everybody wants some new AI trained model. They want some new, you know, web-based API. They need a web app. They need something. They need a mobile app. Well, it turns out that growth is coming out from uh, coming from the low code or no code world. 
So that might impact the way we think of our platforms too. Am I building for the command line developer, the hardcore developer with VI Emacs skills who knows how to write that Java code? Or am I building for the person who likes to point and click? And that's going to be a very way, a very different way of thinking about it. Okay. All right. So how do you do this? How do you figure out who your users are and how do you speak to them? This is important. You got to think about how to build a collaborative environment around APIs and your entire ecosystem should be API driven. Your entire platform infrastructure should be API driven because the goal is to make this plug and play customizable, very reusable, and they in turn, your developers are going to be building APIs themselves. So this is an important thing to understand. Another thing that's important to understand when it comes to being the developer's developer is you need three additional roles. If you're a platform team without these roles, you're going to struggle. All right, so one is a product manager. Who owns this platform, this platform as product, and wants it to be awesome for their customers, otherwise known as application developers, right? Might be the low code, might be the high code. I like low code versus high code. Might be the VI versus Emacs. It might be the you know point and click. It doesn't matter. The product manager basically wants to learn their customer base and make sure their product is awesome for their customers. The UX person. This is the person who's going to be doing that research and understanding exactly what the user experience ought to be. They might be a design person, might be a research person, might be all of the above. And then there's the developer advocate, the person who's going out there and evangelize, make sure those golden path templates are awesome, the documentation is awesome, that you can get onboarded and they're right there in the Slack channel with you every day to say, hey guys, here's how you do our new cool thing. I'm here to help. Well, this can all be one human. It's a little hard for one human to do all these things, but it can be one human. And, but these roles are important when it comes to understanding what it means to have that platform. All right. So here's an example of a senior product manager for developer platform. And I just put this in here. You can see into it as a company. More and more big organizations are hiring product managers to be associated with their internal platforms. So if you don't have this person yet, you really ought to find this person. Perhaps it's you right now in this call. You can volunteer to be that person and take yourself on a whole new career, uh, career trajectory. All right. If you're going to be a product manager, though, you got to at least understand a couple of basic things. Read the book by um, uh, read the book here at SV, uh, SVPG. Right, this is a guy named Kagan. He basically talks about the four risks. The four risks include feasibility, usability, viability, and value. So, is it technically feasible? Meaning, can we even engineer this thing? Is it usable? Can the user even consume it? All right, can they even do what they need to do with that API, that web application, that mobile application, whatever it might be? Can they read the README file and the Markdown? Uh, the Markdown README file and the GitHub repo? Is it viable? Can we afford to do this as a business? Can we invest with all everything we need to invest? And the most important one and the hardest one is, does it add considerable value? Considerable value to offset the cost, whether that be the learning curve or dollars associated with that new innovation that you hope to put out in the market. So think about those four risks. And the one thing I'll tell you, and we got to wrap up here in a few moments, and you feel free to throw questions at me in the chat. I do see those things going by in real time. I also see some of the stuff happening over there in Slack. Looks like Jack there responded to my mentee meter. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a brand name for lie detector. That's a good one. Good one, Jack. Okay. So here's a little special sauce I'll give you when it comes to being that great product manager, being that great platform engineer, being that platform as product person. I want you to think about this basic thing. Focus on the story. And I'll tell you a secret for those folks who are still with me and didn't get bored at this point in time. The story is so important. And I'll, it has to do with this very simple thing. A human cannot protect themselves from a great story. You are programmed since birth to receive great stories. Let's, so let's talk about that for a second. I learned about this, by the way, with a lady, lady named Nancy Duarte. She wrote several books. I learned about Nancy Duarte because at Red Hat, we once paid her $100,000 to consult with us, to teach us this basic principle. I then learned she wrote it all down in books, which I then asked people, hey, let's just go read the books. So that's what we've done. She got this basic idea of the hero's journey, which was identified by Joseph Campbell in his book. And these links are all here are very important. You can actually then go find the, uh, the George Lucas link there is actually where George Lucas, the guy who invented Star Wars, thanks Joseph Campbell for the invention of his book because there would be no Star Wars without Joseph Campbell. So the idea of the hero's journey is a powerful concept. It's programmed in all of us at our DNA level. You as a human, when you watch and hear these stories, cannot protect yourself from them. All right. So it's important to understand a basic thing here. When we are the platform team, we are the product management team, we're the developer advocate, whatever we are, we're not the hero of the story. We are the mentor. All right. So let's kind of dive into that a little bit. 
So one thing when I interview people, and I've often used this before, some people here in the chat might also remember this. I ask people, do you love Lord of the Rings or do you love Star Wars? Or which one, which story do you know better? Did you, did you watch Lord of the Rings? Did you watch Star Wars? And people will pick one or the other. There's always the occasional person like, I hate all fantasy and sci-fi. Sci I don't do any books. Okay. For, for those people who do no books and no movies, I don't know what to do with you. There's got to be something else that you like, like knitting or something. But the idea here is pretty straightforward. Are you Luke or Obi-Wan Kenobi? Are you Luke or are you Yoda? And this is an important understanding of the role. If we're building a platform, if we're the product management team, we're the platform engineering team, we're the platform as product team, we're Yoda. We're not Luke, okay? That's an important idea. As a matter of fact, we're not Frodo, we're Gandalf. Frodo has to carry the one ring to Mordor, okay? And put it in the volcano and destroy it to save the world. Gandalf provides mentorship, tools, and ideas, and education, and encouragement, just like Obi-Wan Kenobi did, just like Yoda does. So that's an important element. You know, and Star Trek doesn't have as much of this idea, right? So DJ Maddie there, Star Trek doesn't have as much of this idea. It doesn't tell this kind of cohesive story. Though I bet it's in there someplace. I have to go find it uh, <laughs> if I, at some point. There's some other examples in the slide deck you can have access to, like Rocky and Karate Kid. So how do you understand those developers, those, those uh, Luke Skywalkers, those uh, Yoda, uh, sorry, those, um, uh, those uh, Frodo-like people? How do you basically think about them? Well, they are creators. They are the people who can do this magical thing by putting their fingers on a keyboard, typing in what looks like arcane gibberish to the rest of the world, like just this weird, sing, you know, sometimes English with curly braces and semicolons or weird spaces if it's Python, right? Or maybe it's capitalized or not capitalized. No one even knows what the heck we're typing. But that ability to put fingers on a keyboard and type out stuff and make it run is the magical superpower we're talking about here. And the way we think of it when we are developers, you're thinking, I made this thing. I created this thing. My favorite is I bent it to my will. I made that damn thing work. It didn't work at all, but that script, that bash shell script that I wrote works now. It does what it's supposed to do. My Ansible playbook does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't matter what the technology is, if it's a playbook, if it's a bash shell script or a piece of Java or Go code. It's the same idea. It didn't exist in this world. I typed it in with my, my fingers and magic is now happening. And even when I go out and talk to children about these basic concepts, I talk about being the producer, not the player, the creator, not the consumer. Because think about the little kids you know these days. They're all playing on their tablets and smartphones. You give them when they're two years old. They're playing, you know, whatever the current game is, Fortnite, et cetera. And I talk to them about being the maker, be the builder, because that's the magic is when we can do that sort of thing. All right. So your ultimate goal is to empower, energize, educate, and enable. you got to figure out how to make those creators excited. You might offer something like this, which is a dev rel way of thinking of the world. What is the developer advocate to? They want to make sure that those people, those developers that you're uh, working with can get on board easily. They have a golden path. They have newsletters and getting started. They have video tutorials. They have an FAQ. Whatever it is, you're making sure they are ready. And I'll just show you this one little thing real quick. And that is, we have a, a uh, let's go here. I'm going to actually give you this URL. So this is our online little example of a portal, okay? And you can see right here. So let's, I'll put that there. So this is backstage as a portal. And this is uh, Janus. This is specifically our version of it. And you can see, I can basically come in here and say, I want a template for a new Ansible job, or I want to use, I want to create a .NET front-end application with CI. I want a Node.js with CI. The idea is that you offer these templates to your developers so they can get started easily. Remember I talked about that developer and that wait time? How long are they waiting before they can be productive? How long are they basically sitting there on their hands waiting for a virtual machine or trying to figure out how many days or weeks it takes to making their first pull request with code that matters? Well, this sort of tool, the portal allows them to basically find all the documentation, figure out what they need to know, get started rapidly. That is the magic of the portal and that sits atop of the stack that we talked about earlier. So this is what people are all excited about, this concept of golden path templates. Of course, there's things like docs and APIs and other aspects of it. Okay, so let's. that's just a quick little thing. There are other things that I could show you when we talk about securing the software supply chain that includes the runtime side of it with things like ACS, which is now available as a cloud service, or maybe you're interested in our new Red Hat Trusted Application Pipeline. I'll give you that URL also. If you hit me up on Slack, we can get you approved and into that system, but that is a brand new software as a service we have out there today. 
And of course, you can do some really fun things with it, like run things through a salsa compliant pipeline. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of things, a lot of capabilities there. All right, I know we're nearly out of time here, so let's kind of wrap things up, okay? So let's remember a bunch of key things we talked about today in a very short period of time. Hopefully it was kind of fun, but I want you to think about focusing on that team, focusing on all those folks that are involved in the creation of software because it is a team effort. We need the developer who can do the magical typing thing. We need a security and compliance officer who's going to make sure that we build things that are more secure, more compliant, and actually adhere to all the rules of the industry, whether that be CIS, Kubernetes, CIS, Docker, PCI, DCS, right? Think about all those compliance requirements we have today in a big enterprise. They are critical. They are important. And most importantly, they should be shifted left and automated. We've got to think about our ops team, whomever is responsible for QA, project management, POs, right, Pro product owners. Everybody's involved with this. And by the way, my DBA there, even though they look like a zombie, it's because they love The Walking Dead. It has nothing to do with the fact that I think they are The Walking Dead. They love The Walking Dead. So I like to basically make the point we are all geeks together, and you can take these geeks to lunch. You should and spend some more time with them. All right. So it's all about continuous improvement. Here is a list of phenomenal books that I'd recommend. These are all fantastic books. And so Marty Kagan inspired for how to be a product manager, along with Teresa Torres and continuous discovery habits. Of course, everyone should have read Accelerate DevOps Handbook, Investments Unlimited, The Phoenix Project, Lean Startup. So if you have to go back in time, and I wouldn't recommend necessarily going all the way back to Crossing the Chasm, though that's a pretty interesting one. But if you want to just go back about 10, 15 years, check out Lean Startup, check out The Phoenix Project. There's also the Scrum Book is fantastic. Uh, I went through the Scrum Book again recently, and I just realized how great it is. But all these books will help you better understand what it means to build better software within your organization and help you achieve your goals, your outcomes uh, with your dev teams, your product teams, your platform teams. And that is the end of my story. And I finished up just in the nick of time, I believe. Let's see if there are any specific questions or thoughts. Marcus. What do you think? I, first of all, I need to do something that we usually don't get to do in these kind of virtual settings. Man, that was awesome. I really enjoyed your presentations. And speaking of all the chat comments, everybody else did too. So you delivered as usual. Um, last call for questions, folks. Uh, anybody you want to like jump in here? If not, um, Burr, do you still code? Like I, I know do. that what you've been doing in the last couple of months, but uh, do you yeah, still th code? These days, I primarily write documentation on what coders want. <laughs> use cases and uh, diagrams, but I still will write a little bit of code and I still have a lot of fun writing some bash shell scripts as an example too, because you got to automate all these Kubernetes things. So just a little Java code, a little bit of JavaScript code is the world I try to uh, be close to. Wonderful. Perfect. Um, I, I can only extend what everybody said in the chat. So thank you so much for your amazing presentations, all the amazing work you're actually doing. Um, everybody else, go check out all the links and all the books and all the free downloads, especially on developers.redhat.com. Um, our next sessions will probably start around, let me take a look, 10.30 a Eastern time, which is like 4.30 uh, P uh, Central European summertime. And uh, I did take a look through the stages that we have. So like you can go and pick your, your stage, but uh, if you want to have a couple of recommendations. So one is definitely a must, which is the Hitchhiker's Guide to Application Connectivity by Mark. So you can't let that slip. Um, and just because I'm highlighting a couple, this is because these people bribed me. Um, so just to let you know, right? So another one is Quarkus for spring developers. So if you really want to go deep into Quarkus, make sure to go to the Java and app modernization stage and listen to Eric. Um, whom else did I find here? Oh yeah, we also have something about Fuse 8. So if you are interested in like more specific topics, uh, also available to you. And we'll have a ton of stuff around modernization coming up, including a lot of open chats and breaks. So check out all stages and uh, make sure to enjoy the rest of your day. Burr, thanks again so much. Thanks everybody for being here and see you in the next session. Yes, thank you so much. You guys have a great day.